Geneva, Palais des Nations at the UN, June 2014. The 26th session on human rights hosted a side event by the Sudvin Development Organization concerning Iran. During the panel concerning freedom of expression, association and assembly in the Islamic Republic of Iran, the speakers were Mr. Amir Nilo on the right to set up labor unions, Mr. Turaj Abu Zarkhani Fard on the government's response to labor unions, Mr. Ali Mehrabi on discrimination against and oppression of the Ahl Ehaq population, Mrs. Mariam Moazen Zadeh on the situation of secular Shias, Mr. Mohammad Kasai Zadeh on structural antagonism of the IRI with human rights, and Mr. Abdul Reza Tajik on intelligence approach of the Iranian conservatives to journalism. Another contributor was Mr. Helmut Gabel, a representative of the International Organization to Preserve Human Rights in Iran, and also a blogger who contributes to the German website mehiran.de. He delivered a speech highlighting the circumstances and reasons why the human rights situation in Iran is still in a deplorable condition and must be strongly supervised and addressed by the international community. The panel was completed with speeches highlighting the disgraceful situation of trade unions, religious minorities like Ahl Ehaq, and Shia cleric Kazemenai Burujedi, who insists on separation between religion and the state, and showing some aspects of the system's ideology. Our next speaker is Mr. Gabel. Mr. Gabel is a German citizen working throughout Europe as a freelance enterprise developer with companies of diverse industry uh, sectors. Besides his professional work, he runs the website mehiran.de, focusing on reports and interviews about background information on Iran, and the beauty of Iranian culture, and the atrocious human rights violations by certain groups within the Islamic Republic of Iran. The title of his speech is Why They Violate the Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you, Zutwind, for organizing this event, and thank you for everybody bringing the different sides of these violations in Iran to the public. I titled Why They Violate Human Rights, and I titled Yes and No. The violators of human rights in Iran increase their villainous activities. There are those who fight for improvements in human rights within the Iranian society, but they face a fierce faction that hides itself like a wolf in a sheep's skin. The faction of the wolves believes in a Fardidian version of messianic ideals, which covers itself behind a mask they call Islam. These people belonging to that faction, they call themselves the network of Amar Yun. And I'd like to name two influential persons that belong to this dangerous messianic sect. One is Mehdi Toeb, the director of Amar Strategic Base, and the other one is called Hossein Shariat Madari. He's the director of daily newspaper Kehan. Well, their ideology promises salvation from earthly agony and misery by ways they hold are the right ones. For dissidents, they have all kinds of harsh and cruel sanctions. We just heard some of them by Mr. Abu Zar Khonifat. These people don't shy at breaking international or national rights and even principles they name Islamic principles. These people don't spare any efforts to demonize dissidents or to heap constructed accusations on them or 
agitate against dissenters. The business they are doing has a name. It is called Geistige Brandstiftung in German or Mental Arson in English. Concerning Mr. Rouhani, the new president of Iran, he might turn out to be a part-time hero who at least tries to unveil the wolves and their intentions. Although the way towards respect for citizen rights and for human rights might still be a long way in Iran. But why should anyone want to violate human rights in Iran? According to members of the system of Veloyat Efari in Iran, like Makarem Shirazi, Ahmad Alam Ol Hoda, and Ahmad Khotami, the government should force people to align themselves with the system in Iran as the only way to paradise is the path that the system leads. Leading people to paradise may sound quite attractive to many people, if you look at it superficially. For this seemingly noble intention, the clerics propose the application of violence against people who oppose their vision and path to paradise. Now, some narrow-minded people might as well ask, but why should people not want to go to paradise and why a government should not pave the way for them? Well, maybe people have their own ways. Maybe they choose not to go to paradise. Maybe this, maybe that. Whatever way an individual chooses, it should be up to them and not up to any system or government to choose for the people. The Universal Human Rights Declaration's answer to such a question is, and I'm going to quote Article 18, everyone, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. Article 18. So this declaration implies that each person should have the right and the freedom to choose his own religion, his point of view, and how to reach paradise or any other goal. As we hear and we heard from different groups and speakers and representatives of ethnic and religious minorities in Iran or any other group, this is still not at all the case in Iran. Imagine, just a few days ago, a law has been passed by the members of parliament that protects clerics who advocate violence against women who don't respect the dress code. Furthermore, the efforts of the Amaryun group and its members consistently impede the steps that the government of Rouhani has undertaken. While Rouhani released Mrs. Sutude in autumn, presumably to achieve some credibility on an international level, at the same time, just a few months later, Basij forces attacked the political prisoners in Evin prison and, for example, continued to destroy Baha'i cemeteries. Concerning dervishes, well, they were allowed to publish their books after eight years and were allowed to attend the Tehran Book Fair and deliver speeches at conferences on Sufism, which is totally new. But, still, they were being oppressed through deliberate arrests, refusal of medical treatment, exertion of force in prison and condemnations without any type of hearing. Here are some well-documented cases, names like Sayed Ebrahim Bahrami, 
محمد علی دهگان برکی محسن اسماعیلی کسر نوری محمد علی صادقی عباس صالحیان برزکی فرشید یدولاهی امید بهروزی Just to give some names but I'm not going to get into details of their stories now. Well, Mr. Rohani fought back with his comments, fought back against these, mm, against these Amaryun um, guys. He fought back with his comments against some Friday prayer clerics when he said, some people seriously have nothing better to do. They have no work, no profession, they live with delusions and they are incessantly worried about people's religion and the afterlife. They know neither what religion is nor the afterlife, but they're always worried. Now, if we ask, is there an improvement or a deterioration of the human rights situation in Iran since the new government started its work? The answer will be yes and no. But what is more important is the type of signals that the international community will give to people in Iran who are suffering and what signals it gives to the representatives of a system that mercilessly imposes its viewpoint of how to reach paradise on each individual. We think that speaking up against this oppression as, for example, Mr. Ahmad Shahid did recently, is still necessary and should occur more often. Even though the importance of the situation in Iran concerning international awareness has been overshadowed by many outrageous conflicts outside of Iran. Finally, to end the speech, let's remember not to tire of repeating Saadi's the poet Saadi, famous advice to his fellow citizens 800 years ago. He said, if the ants unite their forces, they will easily overcome the wolves. And let me add, even those wolves in sheep's skins. Thank you.